Welcome to Tuesdays with Merton. My name is Teresa Sandock. I'm a Servite sister and a member of the Tuesdays with Merton planning committee, along with Dan Horan and Ellen Colt. Dan is a Franciscan friar and director of the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame. Ellen holds the chair in Faith and Life at Baldwin Wallace University, where he is a professor of religion, and he is also a member of the board of directors of the International Thomas Merton Society. Tuesdays with Merton is co-sponsored by the International Thomas Merton Society and the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College. The webinars are aired on the second Tuesday of each month. Our format this evening will be a little different than usual. Our presenter, Małgorzata Pox, lives in Poland, where it is now two in the morning. She understandably elected to record her talk rather than to be with us live. We'll play the recording and then Ellen Culp will make a few remarks afterwards. So uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Malgushata Pox, or Gosha for short. When I contacted Gosha last November to invite her to be a presenter, I expressed my concern for the situation in Ukraine and the refugees streaming into Poland. She responded, Ukraine needs all our prayers these days. When the war broke out, all I was able to do was stare wide-eyed at the images of destruction and cry. So after the third day, I placed a message on a website that I would share my house with a family of refugees. It has been over a month now that three fantastic women with two kids, a dog and a chinchilla have been living with me. Gosha is an assistant professor at the Institute of Literary Studies at the University of Silesia in Katowice, Poland. She has presented papers on Merton at conferences in the United States, Great Britain and Poland. In 2018, she organized a Merton event in Poland to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Merton's death. She was twice a recipient of a Shannon Fellowship, which is a research grant conferred by the International Thomas Merton Society. She has served as international advisor for Poland to the ITMS, and she is a member of the editorial committee of the Merton Annual. In 2009, she received the prestigious ITMS Louis Award for her book, Thomas Merton and Latin America, A Consonance of Voices. She asked me not to forget to say that I helped give final shape to that book. I can assure you that my contribution was minimal, consisting only of a little editing. And now here is Dr. Malgojata Pox speaking on the geography of Legraire as Thomas Merton's ultimate autobiography. Good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be here and I thank um, Teresa Sandok for the invitation. Today I'm going to talk about Thomas Merton's um, The Geography of Logre, but I want to start with a prayer. Tonight I want to offer a special prayer for Ukraine and the people of Ukraine, caught up in the vicious storms of history, whose entire lives have been uprooted by the atrocious war, which is claimed tens of thousands of lives on both sides of the conflict, the overwhelming majority of whom are civilians, people who only wanted to live in peace, but fell victims to an unspeakable horror that should have had no place in the 21st century. I pray for the violated Ukrainian women and for the wounded on both sides of the conflict that they may heal physically and spiritually. And I pray for the millions of refugees, especially those from East Ukraine who are not likely to have a place to return to. Forced into exile and unable to save much of their former lives, they often traveled with their pets, unwilling to abandon them to certain death, refusing relocation to countries which do not accept animals. I also pray for those who have chosen or who had to remain in the war-torn country. Let they never go hungry or thirsty. Let they be safe from harm. Let they live to see their country rebuilt and vibrant as it was before. And I pray for the people of the Russian Federation that they may learn the whole ugly truth about the war oppose it and join the free, democratic, post-war world. 
I pray for the transformation of the aggressor's heart, the cessation of hostilities, the return of the prisoners, and the ultimate victory of unarmed truth and unconditional love, as Martin Luther King Jr. would put it. Brothers and sisters, we all have a dream. It's still the same dream that the human family can sit together at the table of brotherhood and sisterhood, undivided. My presentation will also refer to this dream, the dream of one human family. Um, in the geography of Logre, Thomas Merton used the basic pattern, the pattern of fratricidal violence um, in its many forms, um, the colonized and the colonizer, the white man and the colored man, brother against brother. I'm not going to talk about that, but it's there in the back of my mind, um, as I will be referring to the geography of Logre as Thomas Merton's ultimate autobiography. Of course, we all know uh, the Seven Story Mountain, Thomas Merton's celebrated autobiography, uh, which he published in 1948. It made him famous. The Seven Story Mountain, was the, it was the product of a young mind thirsting for certainties. Um, in this, in this novel, uh, Thomas Merton um, shows his escape from ambivalence and the chaos of pre-conversion um, world, pre-conversion life. We see him thirsting for certainties. Now, 20 years later, um, when he was still working on the geography of Logre, he was a different person. He was a different man. The world around him was different. Um, he frequently expressed dissatisfaction with his famous mo uh, novel's moral rigidity, the finality of opinions, the evasions, the half conscious posturing, uh, the censorship, self censorship, and monastic censorship. And he felt a need to articulate a new understanding of his new, mature, expanded self. He was also fully aware of the role of language um, in explaining oneself or um, talking about himself. Language um, was no longer transparent. Language was a medium in, we, in which we all are or he felt um, uh, engulfed. And um, that was partly also um, a response to his uh, familiarity with the new critical theory, French critical theory, um, which um, in the words of Jacques Derrida announced the end of the book and the beginning of writing the end of the book, the end of presence, um, the end of the speaking voice, and the beginning of writing, the beginning of the trace of presence, representation. So he knew that language um, is a code uh, into which everybody is born. Um, we come into the world already constructed by the, the code of language. So um, the geography of Logre is a very different book and it presents Thomas Merton as a very different man um, from an idealistic and rather narrowly dogmatic hero of the Seven Story Mountain who finds refuge from the unsettling ambiguity of the world in his newfound faith. He became a fully fleshed man of his time, courageous enough to look at the abyss of his own past without flinching, ready to revisit the previously censored moments of his life without further evasions. In this, he was assisted 
by Freudian psychology and by James Joyce, especially Finnegan's Wake. Um, Merton was fascinated by Finnegan's Wake already in 1939 when, when the book was first published. Uh, but that was almost on the eve of his entry um, into the monastery. So he believed that um, his fascination with language, his fascination with li linguistic experimentation uh, had to be sacrificed. Um, but he returned to his fascination with Joyce's Finnegan's Wake um, in the 1960s. And obviously, um, when you read the geography of Logre, you see many resonances, many similarities to, to Finnegan's Wake. Um, and um, um, maybe just a basic thing before I move on to um, the, um, the geography of Logre and Thomas Merton's autobiography. I think it needs to be said that um, James Joyce worked on um, uh, Finnegan's Wake for 17 years. Out of a random compilation of fragments and sketches, it gradually grew into a total book. Now, if you pick up Thomas Merton's The Geography of Log Red, um, in the author's note, you read, this is a purely tentative first draft of a longer work in progress in which there are necessarily many gaps. This is only a beginning of patterns, the first opening up of a dream. So he explicitly refers to his um, book um, as a work in progress. Um, so that's the first direct echo of Finnegan's Wake. Also, we are struck here by a different kind of poetics, processual poetics, open-ended. Um, now, the Seven Story Mountain was a well-made story. It had a beginning, a middle, um, and um, an ending. Uh, so there was a climax and the Daniel Moore. Um, it was final product. Now, the geography of Logre is a very different uh, book. It is, um, as I said, processual. Um, there is no closure. Um, it's made up of fragments. It's a collage, a mosaic of um, dreams, um, um, notes from um, Thomas Merton's readings, heavily edited. Um, he was fascinated by anthropology, he would um, include in the geography of Logre a number of um, accounts um, from um, cargo cults um, of the South uh, Pacific, um, the ghost dance movement um, of, 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 of um, um, American Indians, um, a number of other cultural narratives. Um, as a matter of fact, well, this is the table of contents. So you can see that the geography of La Grere is organized into four cantos, um, the four points of the compass, south, north, east, and west. Um, and the whole is preceded by a prologue entitled The Endless Inscription. Um, now, um, in my reading, the endless inscription refers, among other things, also to Thomas Merton and his endless inscription into the text of history, uh, of cultural narratives. Um, and um, the most autobiographical fragments in the entire geography of Log Rare um, is the North Canto, <clears throat> um, especially uh, the first text, Queen's Tunnel, which uh, centers on New York's borough um, of Queens, where Thomas Merton spent much of his childhood and youth. It's the most hermetic, um, the most personal uh, text. Um, 
in, uh, in log rare, what is interesting is that North is the only um, canto that has a separate prologue. Why I have a wet footprint on top of my mind, uh, which explicitly um, introduces um, the, the speaker. And this is where I would like to start <clears throat> in order to uh, present, perhaps in greater detail, uh, the changed poetics of Thomas Merton. And um, perhaps to substantiate my claim that um, Logre is an autobiography or perhaps a collapsed auto ethnobiography. So this is <clears throat> um, how the poem goes. To begin a walk, to make an air of knowing where to go, to print speechless pavements with secrets in my forgotten feet, to go as I feel, understand some air alone, around the formerly known places, like going, when going is knowing, forgetting. To have passed there, walked without a word, to have felt all my old grounds, forgotten world, all along dream places. Words in my feet explain the air of all. Stand, stand in the unspoken, a cool street, an air of legs, an air of visions, geography. I'm all here, there. I think it's it bears stressing that um, the final edition of the geography of Logre does not come from Thomas Merton. He didn't have a chance to finish the book. He left a draft, the first draft um, of the book. Um, with his editor, James Lachlan, um, before he departed for his um, journey uh, to Asia, from which he never returned. So the final edition comes from uh, New Directions. Um, but um, it's interesting to realize that in the working notebook, which contains the major part of the geography of Logre, the title, The Geography of Logre, appears for the first time on page 23, just above Queen's Tunnel, um, as if, <clears throat> um, you know, signaling that um, this was one of the major points of entry uh, into the poem for Thomas Merton, this autobiographical um, component of the poem was important for him. And in this prologue, the word geography um, appears towards the end, geography, I'm all here, there. I think this substantiates my claim that the geography of Logre is Thomas Merton's autobiography. He is um, in all these places um, he's writing about uh, because um, as James uh, Lachlan uh, writes in the forward to the geography of Logre, um, the geography is the geography of Thomas Merton's mind. Um, so um, he says, to begin to a walk, right? To make an error of knowing where to go. We, we see this hesitation. He has to start somewhere. And uh, for, in this book, um, writing, and knowing a one, going is knowing, forgetting. I think um, this poem quite interestingly um, introduces this um, idea of um, a wor work in process. In other words, Merton didn't sit down to write what he knew. He sat down to write what he didn't know. And he was searching um, for understanding while writing. Um, 
he writes, oh, <clears throat> to have felt all my old grounds, forgotten world, all along dream places. Well, he's taking <clears throat> an imaginative, imaginative walk um, across all the old grounds. Um, he's looking back at his life, but also at the experiences. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, um, he read about at his readings um, and um, rather than a total vision this prologue promises um, a kind of um, work in progress um, which um, values endless revisions we won't get any final clarification rather contingent epiphanies. Um, this prologue um, thing tells us that uh, Merton privileges process over the finished product. The speaking subject renounces his mastery over the text, which was characteristic of the first autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, and lets the writing guide him to meanings he cannot anticipate in advance. Going is knowing. Places, times, identities are fluid. They blend, uh, blend into one another, revealing a certain basic design, a basic pattern. And you can see the pattern um, when you read prologue to the entire book, um, the prologue entitled The Endless Inscription, it consists of 18 sections or segments. Um, and it's interesting that on those four pages in the 18 sections, um, the word design is repeated five times. And in section 10, um, we have a, a rhyme, O sign, which is like, you know, the sixth time um, of repeating the word. Um, design, desire, O sign of iron, design of iron, captain design, pain and Abel lay down red designs, on the shadow, the white snake the coil eye design, father of Africa pattern. So the basic design pattern um, of the whole um, um, book is the design of violence, of wrath, um, of fratricidal um, violence, because this is what the text is about. One brother against um, another, Cain and Abel, um, and well, this is of course our Western um, uh, Christian narrative um, about the origin of conflict within the human family. Uh, one brother rises against uh, the, the other. But in other cultural narratives, Merton was finding similar uh, narratives about two brothers um, alienated by a mistake, um, separated from one another. And then when they are reunited, one of them is superior, the other is inferior. One is white, the other is colored. One is rich, the other is poor. And what Merton hears in the cultural narratives about those two brothers is a plea of the inferior brother for recognition, for um, inclusion in the human family on his own uh, terms. Um, so we have the basic design of violence, fratricide violence. And on the most uh, personal level, uh, Merton is also thinking about his own relationship with um, uh, John Paul, with his younger brother. Um, the relationship was far from ideal. And from time to time, um, the uh, fratricidal violence and fratricidal conflict also resonate 
um, with Merton's personal history. Um, so um, the task for Merton was how to translate himself and his personal story into the more universal realm of the mythopoetic, the realm of Eros, Thanatos, and Ananke, um, love, death, and fate. Um, well, um, he does it on a number of levels. First, still in the same prologue, the endless inscription, he refers to his ancestry. Uh, in section seven, he talks about his Welsh um, roots. He talks about grandmother with Welsh birds, right? The Pearsons and birds were um, his Welsh um, ancestors. Um, he refers to his family ancestor, the lieutenant in the hated army, cursing pale eyed Albion without stop. Um, so here, we see already uh, that uh, Merton is part of the history of the colonization of the world, the colonization um, of um, the Celts um, is part of his family history. He talks um, about himself um, as well having a celt blood that washes in his um, veins, to seize in myself Irish and German, so blood washes in twin sea green people. Um, so interestingly, uh, Merton um, is part Welsh and part Anglo-Saxon, Irish, German, Welsh, and English. Um, so he's both colonized and colonizer. Um, which is in keeping with James Joyce's uh, Finnegan's Wake. Um, I don't want to become too chaotic, but I feel that I need to make um, a, a passing reference uh, to Finnegan's Wake at this point, because um, in Finnegan's Wake, um, the, the, the focus of Finnegan's Wake is on the Earwig family. And this is the human family, the, the human family. Um, the man is called Adam, the woman is called Eve, but they morph into other characters, assume other names. So they are the universal human family. They have three children, one daughter and two sons. One of the sons is called Abel, the other is called um, Cain. So we have the human family. Um, and um, as I said, the protagonists constantly morph into other um, characters. And the same happens in Thomas Merton's uh, The uh, Geography of Logre, because um, he is inscribed into the universal pattern of history. He's both a colonizer and a colonized. He's both the younger brother and the older brother. Um, and um, um, on the, on the level of um, uh, characters, if you look at, right, um, the beginning of uh, the endless inscription, the first section um, reads, long note, one would thrush, hear him low in waste pine places, slow doors always of abels open late, tar had unshaven, the captain signals, should they wait? Um, it's very dense. The fragment is very dense. Uh, and you have several texts here. Um, I think the major text, the overall text here, is one that refers to the story of slavery, African slavery. But then uh, the captain, um, is a character that recurs in various fragments of the text. So we can argue that the captain um, is um, a figure of a white male. And possibly, at least in my reading, um, the captain can also refer to Thomas Merton 
an able able bodied white um successful white uh, man um who he was a fit sports player in his youth who won a scholarship to cambridge um so already here i think we can detect a, 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 an autobiographical reference um now how to understand the opening fragment in the context of Merton's life. Slow doors always of Abel's open late, turret unshaven, the captain signals should they wait. Well, I think that um, on another level, the captain can also refer to the inner captain or the pleasure principle, um, which would resonate with the Freud uh, reading. In Merton's life, the door of desire, and let us remember that he's talking about the desire, desire of or sign of fire or era day. So desire is somehow implicated in this violence um, that uh, the geography of Logre talks about. So in Merton's life, the door of desire inched open. Um, as early as 1921, when Ruth Merton died of cancer, Tom was merely six, in, six years old. And the door of desire stayed open until the worldly young man's dramatic religious conversion in the late 1930s. When read from the biographical perspective, these expository lines of the prologue situate the speaker among other young able-bodied um, males in pursuit of forbidden pleasure. Hedonic impulses must have been especially difficult to resist for the mother bereft child shuttling between his father and maternal grandparents without a permanent home or sense of direction in life. Continually taken to and out of ever new boarding schools and confronted with challenges beyond his emotional scope. On the whole, the boy was more a passenger than a resident in life. He suffered from a permanent culture shock resulting from crisscrossing cultures, languages and mentalities. And I'm skipping the details because I assume that most, most of us um, know um, uh, Thomas Merton's um, early life, at least from um, the Seven Story Mountains. Um, when he reached uh, the age of 16, and this coincided with the young man's discovery of Freud and um, D.H. Lawrence, and his attendant conviction that all repression was unhealthy. By the time of his disastrous year at Cambridge, desire's sign of ire was imprinted all over him. Um, so, um, the captain as the pleasure principle. The America of the 1930s advertised in the emerging movie industry and the illustrated magazines as a consumerist paradise turned loose desires that had to be satisfied the moment they appeared. Um, the compulsion to satisfy his desires nearly drove Merton to ruin. In the context of the, uh, sorry, in this context, the prologue's opening question, should they wait, could possibly refer to human drives and desires. And the answer would be no, since the demand for instant gratification excludes the peril of pleasure. Um, Okay, I realize I need to skip a few insights for lack of time. Okay, now I move on to um, an apparently unrelated section. I mean, section unrelated to anything um, that I've been talking about so far. And perhaps 
unrelated to Merton's biography, but I argue that everything is related to Merton's biography and everything is about him. So we have this cryptic fragment. German Tristram is all made grammar. I had a toy called Tristram and Gerton's needle in another sensitive place. Um, so a moment ago, in the same section five, um, Merton identified himself as an um, Irish and German or Welsh and German to be more exact. Um, he accepts his Anglo-Saxon complicity in the process of, of suppressing difference and starts to atone for it by retrieving the inner other. Later on in the same section, he, he writes, in my blood fight hills, plains, marshes, mountains. Section, the se section five of his prologue at the endless inscription to demonstrate that even uh, the most um, possibly cryptic um, uh, a text can have uh, personal resonances. Um, Merton has just announced his um, Anglo-Saxon complicity in the process of suppressing difference. Um, the Anglo-Saxon and the, and the Celt are two warring brothers. And um, in Geography of Logre, Merton uses his Anglo-Welsh genealogy as a demonstration of the dramatically complex process of identity formation. Now, I want to argue that um, this text, now this section about German Tristram also has profound personal connotations. Um, German Tristram is all made grammar. I had a toy called Tristram and Gerton's needle in another sensitive place. So Tristram, um, Tristram was um, an actual historical personage. He was um, born in Normandy in the 12th century um, and made a name for himself during the Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland in um, 1177. Um, known as Sir Lawrence, uh, he became the first Lord of Howth Castle. Um, Sir Amory Tristram is also an early incarnation of the Joycean character HCE, um, which can stand for Here Comes Everybody, or Health Castle and Environs. Um, importantly, um, I can hear the echoes of Thomas Merton's um, experience of reading James Joyce, um, James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake for the first time in 1939 in this um, fragment. Um, he read Finnegan's Wake um, in 1939, the year when the Second World War broke out and when Germany was gradually devouring Europe. Hitler had just annexed Czechoslovakia and Austria, and his troops were about to invade Poland. Uh, so this line about German Tristram with its Joycean echoes would situate the 24-year-old Thomas Merton at the nexus of complex textual, historical, and political references. Um, still, None of these references would excuse calling the heroic Britson or the legendary Arthurian knight uh, Tristram from the legend of Tristram and Zelda, a German Tristram. But remember that um, all the characters constantly morph into their opposite. So um, strictly speaking, uh, the historical Tristram was an invader. Born in mainland Europe, he crossed the channel with the invading Norman troops and supported a dynasty whose claim to the English throne was tenuous. Um, his participation 
in the conquest um, helped install the Norman dynasty in Ireland. Um, when they were in power, the Norman rulers, in a gesture typical of all tyrants, proceeded to supplant the old Germanic ruling elites with the newly imported French ones. Normal Britain became a powerful empire, but the cost of modern nation building was high. Brutal suppression of minorities, bloody wars of succession between England and France became daily realities. Centuries later, the highly prosperous and relatively peaceful British Empire spanned nearly half the world, but Pax Britannica had its price. At the height of its power, Britain was just as uncompromising in forcing its regulations on the conquered nations as any colonizer. Uh, so Merton, I think, by using uh, the phrase German Tristram and evoking this very complex historical, um, um, those historical references, um, is calling our attention to uh, the process at work that oppressors constantly morph into the oppressed that today's heroes are tomorrow's villains, and history is constantly being rewritten from the victor's point of view. Now, what about grammar? Well, it can possibly be a misspelling of grammar and a hint that Merton, um, in the space of the geography of Logre, is conducting his own, uh, his own war on language. Um, a hint at his attempt to destabilize the system by dismantling the syntactical rules supporting it. But why should it be capitalized? Possibly it may be a misspelling of gammer, a humorous old fashioned word for an old woman, most probably derivative, a de derivative of grandmother. Um, it bears repeating that all the intertextual references in Logre are in one way or another intimately entwined with Merton's life and the history of his world. The allusion to Burton's needle being no exception. And here's what I'm driving at. At the time when the winds of history was, were raging over Europe, Merton was reaching a turning point in his life. Remember, it's 1939. He became a devout Catholic, graduated from the University of Columbia, reorganized his life, and was considering priesthood as a vocation. In mainland Europe, Germany had just invaded Czechoslovakia, as I said. In the US, Merton, Robert Lux, and Ed Rice were spending the summer of 1939 in an isolated cottage in Olin, New York, trying hard to write novels. Merton was working enthusiastically on a book he called The Labyrinth. In September, Hitler invaded Poland. Merton was trying to join the Franciscans, was rejected, decided to lead the monastic life in the world. And in the autumn of 1940, just as German planes were flying over Britain in preparation for a latter day Germanic invasion of the Isles, Merton started teaching at St. Bonaventure University. His course was English literature from Beowulf to Romanticism. As he was lecturing about the ancient bards, the daily press continued to provide alarming news about enemy raids on the English cities associated with those bards. Now, one of these days, Merton would have talked about Gamma Gurton's Needle, the oldest verse comedy in the English language. It was published in the middle of the, ninth, uh, of the um, 16th century. The proto plot of this comedy revolves around the search for a needle mislaid by a woman known as Gamma Gurton. The object turns up and the husband sit sits on it. In Freudian psychology, and that was a huge influence on um, pre Getsemane Merton, the pain caused by having sat on a needle and the resulting wound in a sensitive place right, would have implied castration or at least 
um, the fear of being castrated by an overbearing woman, the castrating woman type. Now, was that not young Merton's position vis-a-vis -vis women? Um, Okay, so the wealthier boys of Merton's generation, especially those educated as, at prestigious public schools, were culturally conditioned to be tough guys, to be warriors like Tristram. Um, or perhaps like his more modern wartime incarnation, the secret agent operating behind enemy lines. The young Merton was fascinated with the spy figure. He read books and comics and watched popular movies revolving around the spy's exploits, and then tried to model his behavior accordingly. Western culture expected a superhero, like a spy, to have amorous encounters with seductive women, but avoid permanent engagement, because permanent engagement would hamper uh, the spy's freedom uh, and endanger his missions. In the optics of the mid-century popular comics that Merton read, women were to be enjoyed but not treated seriously. They were at least potentially, if not actually, castrating women. Um, so um, I think that the phrase German Tristram is a kind of self-identification, not toward uh, Merton's Teutonic roots, the Anglo-Saxon element in his blood, which was on the ascendancy in the 1920s and 1930s, when Tom would drive fast sports cars with his younger and equally confused brother, John Paul, row, run the marathon, box, enjoy causing trouble whenever the opportunity arose. In his Cambridge year, he womanized, fathered an illegitimate child and driven to the depths of nihilistic nihilistic despair, uh, he was ready to get his body pierced not by needles but by iron nails in a parody of the crucifixion. Tom Merton was a warring Tristram, a highbrow misogynist who repressed his more feminine traits and compensated for his anxieties by engaging in all male pursuits. Um, When the biblical Sophia has not yet revealed her presence, women were prey to be pursued, pleasure to be had, or burden to be rid of, rather than partners and wisdom figures to be met as thou and appreciated as significant others. Um, okay, and very briefly, um, I want to have a look at um, another fragment from the same section. Um, so the young Merton, um, before permanently leaving England for the United States, Merton, a tough cere a cerebral guy and an aspiring writer who had just, uh, been, um, who had just been expelled from Cambridge um, and um, who had known the attraction of um, pubs um, and who was a sports player, um, has a final look um, at the cliffs of Dover. So we have now uh, the fragment that refers to this. The channel bards board a house next sweet pup smell on cliff of winds. Cliff was a Welshest player on the rugged green at Clare, away next to Newwood Forest full on hunter map ship of forest mast in Bullio wood, minster in the new wood, minster fratter in the grasses, summer sun, I lay me down in woods amid stone borders of bars. This is another very dense fragment um, which collapses uh, temporal and spatial um, uh, dimensions. Um, first we hear in this fragment and allusion to the cliffs of Dover from which the 19 year old Merton shattered by the Cambridge experience was saying farewell to his European past 
and looking forward to a new start in America. Um, in such decisive and highly emotional moments in life, people tend to be reminded of the places, persons and experiences that have made a lasting impression on them. But the recollections projected on the screen of memory cannot be expected to unfold logically. Rather, they follow the logic of dreams. They tend to be disordered, dissociated, kaleidoscoped, dissolving into each other. As Merton's memory was racing through a tangled note of recollections, it apparently collapsed the impressive image of masts, okay, of masts moored at various beautiful places. Okay, uh, the word polio um, in French means beau, beautiful, and lieu, place. Um, of course, there is a reference to um, Claire College, but now um, I want to pick up another um, collapsed image. So the impressive image of masts moored at various beautiful places of the French Riviera he had just revisited a year before to celebrate his 18th birthday with the tall trees of New Forest, a royal hunting area in Hampshire, where he must have seen the remains of the once imposing Bolio Abbey, the oldest Cistercian Abbey in England, it comes from the 13th century. Um, in an imposing imaginative, imaginative and temporal shortcut, the once aspiring channel bard who has become a published poet and a Cistercian monk in the meantime, in the 1960s when he was writing these words, recollects the Volio Abbey of New Forest, England from the hospitable shade cast by the tall forest trees of the Cistercian monastery that has become his home in the new world. As a new Woodminster frater, finally and relatively at peace with himself and with the world, he can now slow down and meditatively pull the fragments of his decentered life together. The last lines of section five breathe a sense of peace and quiet. So once again, here's the fragment. Um, and uh, a welcome break after the preceding hurried lines and the confused jumble of dissonant, dissonant images. By entering a monastery, the speaker imaginatively dies to the world and its confusion, but the reference to a repose on a quick grassy spot and the stones, possibly tombstones, can also be read as the 50-year-old monk's anticipation of his literal death. The United States of America gave him a fresh start in life. The monastery offered him a new life, but he was now on the threshold of another birth. And this is where I will stop, uh, because more or less, I think I covered the ground uh, that Merton had covered previously in the Seven Story Mountain, but in a completely different idiom, completely different diction. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, that was pretty amazing, huh? We thank Gosha for an amazing gift to us. Uh, I, I can imagine many of us have not read the geography of Logrere. Um, I count myself as one of those just a few weeks ago. What I'd like to do is simply just take a couple minutes and add a comment or two that may help us summarize what we've heard and then uh, we'll be done for, for the evening. I read a fair amount around Merton's words and the geography of Logrere, our own Paul Pearson uh, has a, a number of nice reflections on, on this piece. I like a quotation he uses from Anthony Padovano, who describes the geography of Loguer as simply astonishing, the language stunning, the imagery innovative and probing. This piece contains all of Thomas Merton. And from what we've heard of Gosha, 
Um, it certainly does, and we didn't hear it all. Another quotation which I use, which I think picks up on what she said is, this piece that Merton was writing on is the history of a human family tragically torn asunder, but pathetically persistent in its dream for harmony. And I like Gosha's argument that Merton is representative of the human family. I was intrigued that she calls this his ultimate autobiography. And I was thinking how cool it would be to read Seven Story Mountain and then read the geography of Lograire. That would be a trip. She says it includes all of the geography of Thomas Merton's mind. And I would simply say in closing and then throw it back to our own Teresa, Gosha has given us a reason to read the geography of Lograire and a roadmap to begin to find our way. So let's gird up our loins and read it. Teresa. Thanks so much, Alan, for those concluding words. Um, certainly, um, I want to thank Malgajada Pax for her challenging and illuminating uh, presentation. And um, you know, I too find it uh, wanting to go back now and read the geography of Legrere through the lens of uh, an autobiography. That'd be very interesting. I want to thank Father Dan Horan and the Spirituality Center at St. Mary's College for providing the Zoom platform and technical support for Tuesdays with Merton. And Bob Grip, who posts the webinars on YouTube, Mark Mead, who makes them available as podcasts, and all of you for joining us today and for continuing to spread the good word about Tuesdays with Merton. You can find links to the recordings of previous webinars at merton.org slash ITMS. And there you will also find information about the International Thomas Merton Society. And I, I suspect most of you are already members. And if you aren't, we invite you to become a member. I want to let you know that Tuesdays with Merton is taking a summer vacation for the months of July and August. We'll be back in September with Dan Horan as our featured speaker to launch our third year of Tuesdays with Merton. So now, goodbye, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in September. <laughs>